Blake and Jeff and I called a meeting with the whole crew. And we all cried. We all worked together so um, families could make a living and they helped us pay our mortgage payment without our crew. Um, we wouldn't have a home and we're very aware of that. In the 1950s, Jeff Bedlington's grandfather began growing seed potatoes. In 2010, Jeff and Diana took over the farm. They raised their family here and grew the farm to 500 acres. We're a little bit smaller than some other seed potato farms, so we grew niche varieties, which means we grow the fancy potatoes you would get in an expensive restaurant, or if you would go buy them in a little bag at the grocery store, they were the pretty ones that shined up. Like most family farmers, the Bedlingtons took pride in caring for the land and worked to enable the farm to go to the next generation. Daughter Clara and son Blake were already involved, and their two-and-a-half-year-old grandson showed early interest. In the spring of 2023, Jeff and Diana decided they could not continue farming. Blake and Clara called us to their house. We had all the potatoes here ready to plant in the spring. It was the 1st of April. All of our... We started planting on the 1st of May, so all our seed was ready to go. We were ready to go. And Blake just said, I can't do this for a lot of reasons. Um, do we plant? And you said... No. No. We had to keep it quiet for like a week or 10 days, and that was the worst. One of our guys was expecting a second baby and had just said, hey, I just bought a house. And we were literally sick. Because they had clothes on the house and, you know, to buy a house, you got to have a job, right? You know, there's just such a, historically at least, um, a legacy component to, uh, to agriculture that a lot of this is, you know, passed down from one generation to the next. So there's more family transactions in agriculture than there is in different types of businesses. It's, it's way more common. When a senior generation is looking at retiring, a lot of times it's not, well, I need to get top dollar for what I've helped grow. It's, well, I want to have enough to sort of be comfortable while making sure the farm can still succeed for my kids. And we have a grandson that's coming up, you know. Loves the John Deere. Yep, he loves the John Deere and it, you know, breaks my heart because you look across the road and there's the farm that's no longer yours, right? And it's, it's uh, it really hits home because I wonder if what, what's next for him, you know? He's only two and a half, but what's, you know, for me that's a hard, you know, to, to see it stop at that generation. This is a service dog, by the way, and so she's like, dear Lord, you guys have had it. <laughs> um. Like most family farmers, Jeff and Diana Bedlington very much wanted to keep their grandfather's farm in the family. With costs rising far faster than the prices paid, smaller and even medium-sized farmers face a difficult choice, grow much larger or sell out. It's been expensive. And that was one of the reasons is we didn't have the extra. Margins were. Yes. They were. Every maxed year. Maxed out. For example, um, our fertilizer, what it had been 2021, was 150,000. And last year it was 300,000. The fuel um, last year for July was $56,000. And the year before was 12. Um, my payroll went up 30 to 40 percent and that is all money that was staying in this county that is gone. Agriculture in general compared to you know most businesses is way more capital intensive so you're having to you know 
replant crops, increase the number of acres you're planting each year to stay competitive. Um, a lot of high cost machinery and infrastructure. So what has happened is there's been upward pressure and inflationary pressure on just sort of all of the overhead costs of running a farm. So no matter what commodity you're selling, there's always gonna be some pretty big swings as far as like what you're getting as your pay price. Farming is a very challenging business to be in because you're price takers, not price makers. And as a result, your, your margins are extremely small. Oftentimes, a lot of these smaller farmers, not only do they have difficulties with the economics of farming as the margins continue to get more and more difficult, but they also have to deal with uh, regulatory issues, policies that uh, while oftentimes are well-intended, cause a lot more difficulty and challenges for them to actually be able to survive. Uh, things like labor, uh, water quality, water quantity, a lot of these things, a larger farm might be able to navigate a little bit better because they just have more resources to be able to deal with some of these regulatory challenges that come up. Therefore, they have an advantage over these small farms. Uh, it's not necessarily an intended one, and it certainly isn't intended by these well-meaning policies, but that's the reality of what we face. You know, we would have had to probably double our size and to, to keep it going which with the land situation in Whatcom County, you know, we have to, you know, you gotta be able to have the land to do that. And that's another challenge in itself. And then just our customer base and stuff is, is changing a lot. There's a lot of the smaller operations getting bought out. Even some of the bigger operations are being consolidated or, or bought out. Buy the same corporate investor or investment group and they are not farmers. What has happened is there's been upward pressure and inflationary pressure on labor especially, but just sort of all of the overhead costs. So that has eight margins way over and tightened them up over like a long period of time where there might be years still with really good margins, but that floor just kind of keeps steadily going up and up and up and making it more challenging. When you spend 16 hours a day with people, they are your family. And to not have them here is a huge loss. Um, we prayed together, we ate together, we celebrated birthdays or children's birthdays, graduations, college acceptances, quinceaneras. Miserable plantings, um, you know, bad grades of spuds, you know, I mean, it all takes the work to get all that done. And it's not all roses. I mean, it's, it's, there's good and bad, but they, they, they've stuck with us. This is probably the, the longest group of people that have worked for us that I could ever remember. They've been around the longest. Our shortest tenure employee was five years and our um, longest tenured employee was 45 years. These farmers look at uh, their employees like family. They've been together for decades and they know each other and they've worked together. And yet these smaller farmers need to pay a, a rate that they can afford to pay based on the products that they get. Labor is one of the greatest costs on a farm. Farmers do not set their own prices. They have to accept what prices the market offers, often against global competitors who pay far less for labor. So, I mean, labor, as far as the cost perspective, you know, that's impacting every business. Some businesses can more easily pass that on to their customers than others. In agriculture, if you're just growing a product and selling it to a co-op or selling it to a, you know, a, a third party, you're a price taker. You're not a price maker. You're just accepting whatever price is what the market is that year. And so again, that puts pressure on farms to either vertically integrate and to become bigger and to become, you know, further upstream in the process so they can help control some of that or expand and grow more products so they're able to use their labor more efficiently. Um, or the third option is they're gonna have to spend a, a lot of money mechanizing as much as they possibly can. 
to be able to have machines do the works that they used to have a high, uh, you know, a high labor force be able to do. This is a issue about relationships is what we believe. Because of some decisions that were based um, for Washington State, like the time and a half law with overtime. And what that means is in agriculture, it started at 50 hours and then it was at 45. And now it will be at 40 hours that you have to pay time and a half. And we would work during harvest 16 hour days. And that took probably three to 400,000 two years ago and would probably have cost us a half a million this year if we would have chosen to plant. So paying overtime does in fact seem fair and reasonable on its face, but for farming, it really doesn't work as well. Uh, farming is very seasonal in nature and it becomes very difficult to say, well, we're just gonna work 40 hours a week. There are weeks when you need maybe need to work 60, 80 or 100 hours, and then you've got weeks where it might only be 10 or 20 hours. So when you say it's going to be 40 and that's all there is, and then you combine that with the economic challenges of extremely tight margins with farming, it just becomes really difficult for a farmer to figure out how am I going to balance the needs of my worker with uh, the needs of my farm. This in turn hurts farm workers because instead of them being able to make a, a whole lot of money during a seasonal time, the farmer has no other choice but to limit them to the 40 hour work week. And therefore they're receiving much less in their paycheck. For the Bedlingtons, these economic pressures meant closing the farm and saying goodbye to longtime employees who had become like family. We all cried and hugged. And I, I think for some of them, it, it kind of hit them, um, like it had they had to process it for a little bit before they could really gather what that meant. And then, yeah, and it was hard. You know, they took care of us. You know, so uh, we were definitely we took care of them. You know, we had no turnover, zero. You know, we don't know, you know, I mean, they could shut us down in July or June or whatever, um, and, and we wouldn't have had a crop. That 70 acres where we had beautiful spuds growing, we got a letter saying you'll get a $10,000 fine a day if you continue to water. Well, if we did the math, that's probably seven, 800,000, close to a million dollars in product that is sitting in the ground that would be gone if we had gotten that letter in June, and that alone would cripple that would have, us. That would have shut us down. We would have been shut down. Farming has been going on in Northwest Washington since the late 1800s. There was plenty of water for farming from the Nooksack River and the streams. Rain and melting snow fill the streams and fields, so they flood. But in late summer, less rain and warmer temperatures mean the natural flow is much lower. The lower flows and higher temperatures can harm fish. Surface water was first regulated in beginning in 1917, and the groundwater statute followed in 1945. So the in-stream flow rule in the Nooksack Basin was adopted in 1985, and that rule uh, sets minimum flow levels for the Nooksack River and various streams throughout the basin. So those flow levels are uh, most often not met in the summer low flow period. So it effectively um, shut down all new water rights from being approved after 1985. Taking water from streams to irrigate crops was the normal practice. But with the growth of farming, the water taken from streams and the river became a problem. So farmers dug wells and used groundwater instead. Farmer dug a well prior to 1945. They weren't required to get a groundwater right um, for the use of that groundwater. Ecology has um, since asked those pre-1945 groundwater users to file claims of that water use to document that water right. Um, and if they did not understand the need to file a claim to document that pre-code um, groundwater use, then it would appear as if they did not have a water right um, for that um, 
to use that well. Many farmers became aware or were made aware that they had been irrigating on lands, maybe for generations, that did not have a legal water right. So ecology staff told um, these farmers that if they applied for water rights in the 90s, ecology would allow them to continue to irrigate those historically irrigated properties while those applications were pending with ecology. I think there are around uh, 200 um, water right applications that were filed about that time in response to this um, statement by ecology. And to my knowledge, none of those water rights have been processed at this point. Through the early 90s, and even now, where applications, there has not been any water right um, said, oh yeah, you can do this legally. Well, I think the 90s, they, they basically said, let's get your applications in. So you had all these farmers, you know, that didn't have a water right, but still have been watering for, since the, the, 30s. the 40s, 30s or 50s or, 40s, or whatever. Yeah. Um, they said, well, just get your applications in and we'll, we'll, it'll be okay. We'll, it'll be okay. We'll get it worked out. Well, none of those applications have been touched. So even though we've been watering since the, since my grandpa started, you know, so I'm not, I don't feel like we're illegal, but according to ecology or whoever, we are out of compliance. And that doesn't sit well with us because we're trying to do this right. Losing the farm was not an easy decision for the Bedlingtons. Rising costs of labor, new overtime rules, a broken promise by the Department of Ecology to provide secure water rights. All these add up to ever greater pressure. But the deciding factor for Bedlingtons was the decision by the state of Washington to sue all water rights holders, an action called water rights adjudication. Ecology intends to file what's called a general stream adjudication of water rights in the Nooksack Basin at some point um, this spring of 2024. Um, the adjudication is a lawsuit where ecology is the plaintiff and all water users um, within the Nooksack Basin will be um, the defendants. So these water users include water right holders and permit exempt uh, well owners or you know farmers that hold water rights that um, irrigate large tracts of land. Um, everybody will need to participate in this lawsuit uh, between ecology and the water users uh, to defend their existing water use in Whatcom County Superior Court. Hundreds of the remaining farmers in Whatcom County have land without completed water rights. But not just farmers are affected by this state lawsuit. Everyone is affected. The thousands of residents who rely on wells for their water, and even local cities, will all have to defend their right to use water. So if ecology is made aware that uh, water use is occurring in an area that um, they don't have records of a legal water right for, they will um, send a letter to the property owner uh, that's generally referred to as a technical assistance letter that states, you know, we don't see record of a water right for this property that you um, are irrigating. We will try to work with you to come up with a solution um, to get you a legal coverage of that water right or potentially be subject to uh, fines for illegal water use. Well, you pay by the acre for an attorney to represent you um, when the lawsuit is leveraged, but you need to have that attorney on retainer before. So that's, you know, probably $40,000 without them doing any work for you. So it's expensive. And that's an annual retainer. Yeah, right? it's an annual retainer. So it's expensive. And we don't have that with all the other things that we need to do. And um, farming's changed. It's the amount of energy it takes and paperwork to do it right, the way we can sleep at night, is astronomical. Water rights are at the forefront of a lot more conversations now than they used to be. From a banking perspective especially, you know, they are greatly reducing you know, appraised value on land that doesn't have the right water rights. For a, you know, a small to mid-sized farm, they're so reliant on 
the value of their land and the value of their capital infrastructure that they've had to put in place to operate these farms and proving out either their water rights or acquiring them or it's just taken a lot of extra work in a time where there's a lot of areas on their farm and on their business that are required a lot of extra work. Um, and so it's just stretching people more and more thin. If that's a limiting factor, that can really close the door sometimes to seeing a path for a next generation to take it over. And again, so it just, it's one of many items that is making it harder and harder for farms to be able to transfer from one generation to the next right now. Have your your equipment dealers, your fertilizer dealers, your fuel deal dealers, your um, batteries, you know, tires, uh, tractors. I mean, you have all these people that all of a sudden go, you, "What? What do you mean? Where are you?" Yeah. This doesn't pencil out anymore to be honorable, follow the rules, do what's right. Um, so we want it to work out for everybody, but there are impacts that happen and consequences for decisions. And when you hear the word lawsuit, it brings fear, um, sleepless nights. So this water rights adjudication is yet one more thing that creates a tremendous amount of fear and uncertainty for these farmers out there. Water is the lifeblood of every farm. If you don't have water, you're not gonna have crops, you're not gonna have cows, you're not gonna have a farm. You know, there's a lot of, of farming in the ag community that is passionate not only about this as a way to make money, but a way of life and what it means to, to the area. And we take more and more land out of, you know, agricultural use and put it into development, that's gonna have a long-term impact even for the ones that are staying around because if there's less and less farms, there's less and less infrastructure to support those farms, it really ups the risk on, on you know, the farms that are left. And that's why sometimes it might seem easier to just, well, we're just gonna sell because this is too many roadblocks to try to really pass through. There's enough pressure and stress in farming as it is. You know, this is harvest season, and this is where all the spuds would be piled, um, and piled up to the top of the walls. This farm would be filled with joy and music and 40, 45 people, um, potatoes rolling in. It's hard to look out the windows in the morning and, and just see the lack of life going on. Life and joy. I think we're grieving. Is that the right word? Yeah. We're grieving what is it? It's a, it's a, it's a, a mental roller coaster. is what it is for me. Cause it's like, Hey, we don't have to worry about that anymore, Yeah. but Hey, I really miss that. You know? 